So hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fifth working group meeting of the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis Project. My name is Reagan Cecchio, and I will be facilitating the meeting. Before we get started with the main presentation, I wanna go over a few things about the Zoom platform that we're using today. Next slide, Laura. So first I wanna share the operating procedures we have developed for these working group meetings. First, the meeting is being recorded so it can be posted on the project website. And there will be many opportunities for working group members to share their ideas during the presentation. Until that time, as we go through the presentation, we do ask that working group members remain muted when you are not speaking to prevent background noise. We also want to encourage you to note any questions or comments you have for the discussion segment of the meeting. At that point, please press the raise hand button. When we recognize you, you may unmute yourself to share your question or comment. Please do not type your comments into Q&A as we would like to hear working group feedback verbally. And we are using the Q&A feature for public comments and questions. You will notice that the chat feature of Zoom is also enabled. Only working group members and project staff are able to use this feature. For working group members, if you are using the chat feature, please be sure to select to everyone, and you can see that on screen, so that everyone in the meeting, including public attendees, can see it. So do I think the default says hosts and panelists, but please select everyone. If time permits at the end of the meeting, we will respond to questions from the public submitted through the Q&A section. If we run out of time to respond to questions, you can email us at slx at mbta.com. I will also ask our working group members now to please take a moment to ensure your name and affiliation are displayed correctly um, and to make any adjustments. You can also share your name and affiliation in the chat and select to everyone. Now I will turn this back over to Doug Johnson, the MassDOT project manager for the study. Doug? Thank you very much, Regan. Um, and Amanda and Reagan, I just want to note there are a couple of working group members who are still waiting for panelist links, um, if you don't mind taking care of that while we get started. Appreciate it. Um, so, hi everyone. As Reagan mentioned, my name is Doug Johnson and I am the MassDOT project manager for the Silverline Extension Alternatives Analysis. I am joined today by several of my colleagues from the MBTA as well as the consultant team, um, as well as including Melissa DeLay, the Senior Director of Service Planning at the T, uh, Teresa Carr, the Consultant Project Manager, and Laura Lopez, both from the firm Nelson Nygaard, Gary McNaughton from the firm McMahon, uh, Reagan Checchio, and Amanda Pogan Pogenberg, excuse me, from Regina Villa Associates. The purpose of today's meeting is to review the results of the tier two alternatives analysis with all of you and get your feedback, as well as discuss the next steps for public engagement for this process. Um, I wanna note right off the bat that we are not selecting or recommending an alternative at this meeting. Um, we will be holding a public meeting on December 13th to get feedback from the public and we anticipate conducting some additional analysis uh, this winter before we make any recommendations for the study. Um, we anticipate the study will wrap up this winter uh, around February, and at that point, um, we would be ready to make recommendations based on our analysis, uh, but there's still some work to be done. So today, we wanted to present to you the results of the alternatives analysis so far. Um, at this point, the analysis is substantially completed. There's still a few metrics that we are finalizing and we wanna get your feedback at this point in the process before we conduct the final phase of analysis this winter. The last time this group met uh, several months ago, this past spring, we presented the tier two alternatives that we intended to analyze. Um, as I mentioned, we've now substantially completed that analysis. We're gonna walk through those results for each alternative um, and there will be opportunities for this group to discuss them. We do ask that folks uh, hold their questions until we get to those discussion points. Next slide, please. So before we get into the results of the analysis and talk about each alternative, 
I want to quickly remind everyone what this project is, why we're doing it, um, what the process looks like, and what we've done since the last time we've met. So hopefully you are all familiar with the purpose and need for the project. This really came out of prior studies, namely the Ever Transit Action Plan and the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group report. Uh, the later report was published in 2019, and it recommended extending Silver Line service from Chelsea into Everett and then into neighboring communities. And it also recommended conducting more study to figure out exactly what that service could look like. So this study is the follow on to that, where we are looking at ways to improve transit connectivity between Chelsea and Everett and the neighboring communities, specifically using Silver Line service. Next slide. You'll remember that we started off this process by screening all of the proposals that have been put out recently for uh, direct transit connections to Chelsea and Everett. We screened out the proposals that did not meet our purpose and need. And then in the tier one evaluation, we assessed all of the different possible alignments a service could take between Chelsea and Everett and connected to the neighboring communities. After we evaluated those alignments, we ended up uh, putting alignments that performed well in that evaluation together to create full routes, uh, the tier two alternatives that you see here. Um, and for those, we then created service plans so that we could do the second phase of this analysis. So as I mentioned, we've now substantially completed that analysis. You can see where we are in this flow chart, and we are getting close to sort of the end stages of this process. Next slide. The last time this body met, as I mentioned, was this past spring. And at that meeting, we presented the results of the tier one evaluation and the alternatives that we intended to move into the tier two process. Following that meeting, MAPC actually convened a meeting uh, with project area municipalities and invited our project team. And at that meeting, we discussed adding an additional alternative that would provide a one seat ride from Chelsea to Kendall Square. Uh, thankfully, we had room in our budget and it was within our scope to add that additional alternative. So that alternative, Alt 7, was added and we have now done the analysis for that in addition to the six alternatives that we have presented back in the spring. Uh, as part of that, as I mentioned, we developed service plans for all the alternatives. Um, we have also done cost estimating, uh, ridership modeling, as well as several, several other types of analyses for these alternatives. Next slide. Over the past couple months, we have also conducted public outreach um, related to these alternatives. So we had five in-person outreach events in the study area um, where we went to transit stations, um, provided information to the public about this process and solicited feedback from folks about the alternatives. Um, we currently have an online feedback form open. We've been um, receiving feedback from folks on the alternatives using this feedback form. Um, and we also have a project fact sheet, which is available on the project website. That feedback form is going to remain open through the public meeting, the next public meeting on December 13th. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the initial results we've gotten through that online feedback form at the end of this presentation. But we're hoping that everybody in our working group will help us disseminate information about this project and get the link out for the online feedback form because we want to hear from more people about these alternatives before we move into the final phases of the analysis. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the goals and objectives that we had developed at the beginning of this process, which are how we evaluated all the alternatives. Uh, we're also going to then do a prioritization exercise with everybody on this call using Menti. We're going to ask folks um, sort of what they think should be the most important criteria in this process. We have not weighted any of the <laughs> metrics for this evaluation. Right now we're looking at all of the results of the evaluation uh, process equally, but we wanna know from working group members what they think the most important criteria will be. So we'll go to that in a moment, but next slide. First, we'll say a little bit more about what 
this part of the process is and then remind folks what the goals and objectives for this process, what they are. So there were seven alternatives that went into this tier two phase. We have a list of metrics that we evaluated all of them on, and we'll talk a little bit about the methodology for those in a moment um, after the prioritization exercise. Uh, but we had this list of metrics that fit into five goal areas. So we evaluated all the alternatives based on our goals and objectives. And the idea is to continuously um, narrow down the range of options. So you'll recall from early in the process, you know, we were looking at every possible alignment in Chelsea and Everett and beyond for a service. We narrow down the selection to create a short list of alternatives. Now through this process, we want to continue to narrow down that selection. Um, we anticipate doing an additional model run of the travel demand model for a combination of alternatives. And I'll talk more about what the alternatives look like in a second. Um, but we anticipate doing that additional model run this fall, but before we, or excuse me, this winter. But before we do that, we wanna narrow down the list a little bit more. Next slide. All the alternatives fit into two different groups. The first three were alternatives that we thought of as extensions of the existing SL3 service. So you can see those on the map on the left. And in the following slides, we'll show each of the alternatives individually. Uh, but the three SL3 extension alternatives all looked at different ways to connect the SL3 from Chelsea to the orange line. So the first was to go to Malden Center, the second was Wellington, and the third was Sullivan Square. All three of those alternatives took the same path to get into Everett Square. It was continuing along the commuter right of way, going up, up Second Street, and then Spring Street to Chelsea Street into Everett Square, and then they split off from there. There are four alternatives in this category of SL6 service, which is envisioned as a new service and we followed the nomenclature of silver line service and we have sls one through five um, so this service we named sl6 and we're evaluating it as a silver line service which means you know articulated buses and the other amenities that are associated with silver line service next slide so I mentioned those first three alternatives that are considered extensions of the sl3 you can see them broken up here they all follow the same path in Everett Square, as I said, and then go from there. We're going to walk through the alternatives analysis results um, first in groupings of alternatives, and then we'll talk about each alternative specifically. So I won't dwell on these too much here. And if folks have questions about these um, individual alternatives, we can get into those as we start talking about the results of the analysis. Next slide. But I do want to note that the first three alternatives you see here, alts four through six, um, these were, in addition to the SL3 alternatives, were the ones that we presented to the working group back in April. And then the alternative on the right, alt seven, this is the alternative that was added following that meeting with MAPC and municipalities, and that meeting was in June. Uh, the first three alternatives you see here all originate in Everett go to Sullivan Square and then continue on either to Kendall in the case of Alts 4 and 5 or to Haymarket in the case of Alts 6. The difference between Alts 4 and 5 is that Alt 4 uses McGrath Highway to get to Leachmere and then Kendall and Alt 5 uses Rutherford Ave and the Gilmore Bridge to get to Leachmere and then to Kendall. In the case of Alts 6, it's Rutherford Ave from Sullivan Square um, to the North Washington Street Bridge and then into Haymarket. And then for Alt 7, in order to assess the, the benefit and cost and utility of a one seat ride from Chelsea to Kendall, um, we originate this service at Eastern Ave in Chelsea. So it's the easternmost Silver Line station in Chelsea. It uses the Chelsea busway and then extends it to Second Street and follows that alignment that you saw in the SL3 alternatives and then down lower Broadway to Sullivan and then the McGrath alignment to get into Kendall. Um, so we will say more about how we assumed operations for these alternatives would work, but I wanna note that for all seven, 
in that case where the SL6 is originating in Chelsea, it overlaps with the SL3. So our assumption was that the SL3 would continue to serve all of the Chelsea stations, uh, including the Chelsea commuter rail station, and then the SL6 would overlap with it in the Chelsea busway. I should also note that in ALTS 4, 5, and 6, the way that we modeled these, we assumed the SL3 would be extended into Everett Square in any of these alternatives. And the reason why we made that assumption, uh, Laura, could you actually go back one slide? The reason why we made that assumption is because all the SL3 alternatives use the same path to get into Everett Square. So we wanted to model the SL6 alternatives, assuming the SL3 would get into Everett Square so that we could see what kind of transfer activity would take place between SL3 service and those options for the SL6. Next slide. Actually, yeah, I can go to the slide. So there were five buckets of metrics, five goal areas that we wanted to evaluate these alternatives on. They were expanding mobility and access, advancing equity, improving safety, supporting climate change resilience and sustainability, and advancing feasible and implementable solutions. Next slide. The way that we defined those goals are basically listed here. You can see the individual metrics that we developed in order to assess how well any alternative was expanding mobility and access or advancing equity, et cetera. So for expanding mobility and access, we have things like assessing the ridership, potential ridership of these lines, access to jobs, how competitive these services would be with driving, um, how many units of affordable housing they would provide access to, um, and the potential for transit-oriented development in these areas as well. Um, for advancing equity, we looked at similar metrics but specifically at equity populations. We also looked at reduction in passenger minutes of delay on existing bus routes that would overlap with these services. And the point of that was to see if the infrastructure associated with Silver Line service would provide a benefit to other bus routes and specifically to transit dependent populations using those services. Um, for improving safety, we wanted to make sure that we understood if there were pedestrian or bicycle safety concerns along our alignments and if those could be addressed by any of these projects. Um, and then we wanted to look at changes in mode split using the CDBS travel demand model, changes in greenhouse gas emissions, and then we also wanted to assess cost, constructability, and other factors like that for all of these alternatives as well. I think at this point we will switch to our goal prioritization exercise. Um, and I'll turn it over to Teresa Carr. Uh, Teresa, we cannot hear you. Try this. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Um, so I just put... Teresa, your audio just cut out, cut out. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. All right, excellent. I was doing too many things at once, I think. Um, so I did put something in the chat just now, which is a link to um, menti.com, the polls um, that we will be doing over the next 15 or so minutes. So um, this next piece, will take a little bit of time, um, but not too much. And um, it's an interactive exercise on how we consider certain metrics and goals. Um, you'll need a screen to do this. And ideally, you can have two screens going. That means that you can see what the group is doing on your big screen. And then you're also um, participating in the polls um, on another screen. So oftentimes, people will do their Minty work on their phones. Um, and if you have two screens uh, at your computer, feel free to use your computers for this. We're not going to be doing any official weighting, and this isn't a scientific process by any means, um, but we found it helpful um, as the technical team to be thinking intentionally about um, this piece of what metrics, what goals are, are mattering, and do they matter more than others? 
And we also found when we did this exercise as a project management team that it was very helpful and thoughtful. So we thought it would be helpful to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, and finally, it's really helpful to do this before we launch into the evaluation results, just so that your results aren't, your, your thinking isn't skewed by what we found in our analysis. So at this point, we'll just shift over to um, the mentee. And if you need me to share um, that link again in the chat, I can. And Laura is going to shift over to Menti. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Everyone see that? Sure can. Okay. All right. So we have a series of questions, I think 11, that we're going to be walking you through now. And you should see as um, and if you weren't able to get the code through the chat, here it is um, up at the top, menti.com and the code 3953067. Um, so as Laura progresses through the questions, you should be seeing them if you're using your phone or your second screen. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, and we start by asking you, what is your name? Um, and I will display how you do this. <laughs> Excellent. This is really more a test uh, than anything else of just how this works. <clears throat> All right. And as this isn't scientific, we're going to give this another five seconds, and then we'll go ahead and progress to the next slide. One, two, three, four, five. All right, ready to go. <laughs> okay, so we are asking you um, to distribute 100 points among the goal areas and also the metrics that we're showing. So you can progress to the next slide. And we can see how this is. Just a reminder of our goal areas. I just went through these with you. We have five, mobility and access, equity, safety, climate change, resiliency, and sustainability, feasible and implementable solutions. Um, we're not saying that through this exercise that you don't care about any of these areas. It's just as we consider transitioning from looking at ideas to developing recommendations, what is, more important than um, other aspects. So let's continue. So here's your new question. Um, how should we prioritize the following uh, metrics under expand mobility and access? So each of you take your time, get to 100, hit submit. And as you hit submit, you'll be seeing the results on the screen, on the big screen in front of you. And we'll... Um, give this about a minute. Um, I do want to note for folks, there was a question in the chat about whether this was, um, if this exercise was open to members of the public. Um, since you can see the URL and the code to get in there, um, anyone who's on this call right now can see that. So um, members of the public are welcome to participate in this if they'd like to. Um, as Teresa said, this is not obviously a scientific exercise and um, the results of this exercise are not going to solely decide how we end up weighting the metrics for these alternatives, but we do want to understand from our working group through this exercise what everyone's priorities are. And obviously, we'll be following up with all the municipalities to have individual meetings with you this winter to get more into the results of this analysis. Uh, spend more time talking about the methodology and understanding um, what priorities are from individual municipalities. So don't think of this as the, the last time we'll ask you these questions, basically. 
All right, thanks, Doug. I think we have critical mass participating at this point, seeing um, a greater um, uh, awaiting of total ridership and also access to opportunity. We're defining opportunity as jobs that are accessible within a 45 minute transit commute. Um, and then affordable access to affordable housing, a ratio of transit time to drive travel time that is a level of transit reliability um, and transit priority. It's associated with transit priority and TOD potential um, bringing up the rear. So let's proceed to the next one. Okay, so this is um, advancing equity. So same basic exercise, here are all the metrics within this goal area. So go ahead and uh, take a minute and um, tell us what you think and hit submit when you're ready. Y'all are getting faster. Give it another 30 seconds or so. All right, I feel like we have critical mass. Let's just look at it real quick. Um, so we're seeing Three metrics rise to the top here uh, within this goal area versus the percentage of totally da total daily ridership that's estimated to be within transit critical populations. Just a reminder that we use the same definition as um, uh, MassDOT and MBTA did with the Beanard process of how we're defining a transit critical population. It was a mixture of um, low income um, people of color um, looking at elderly and youths um, and zero vehicle households. Um, reduction daily passenger minutes of delay. Um, here we're looking at um, who all can use transit priority. It's not just Silver Line if we make that investment, um, who all can take advantage of that in terms of other MBTA bus routes. And then access to jobs again uh, within a 45 minute transit commute for the, um, the subset of the transit critical populations. So let's proceed to the next one. And love the participation here. So safety. We only have two metrics within that safety goal. So um, please tell us what you think. I think we can actually skip this one because they're equally important and it's not in either or situation. So Laura, if you're able to just go to the next one, yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I will go to the next slide too so I can see. So here we're looking at um, climate resiliency and sustainability. So our metrics here, are transit mode split and um, reduction or change in greenhouse gas emissions. All right, results are coming in very fast. I'll give it just another second. All right, I feel like this is critical mass. We have 20 um, people submitting and uh, two thirds, one thirds on transit mode split and greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, reductions. Let's proceed to the next one. So feasible and implementable solutions. Um, we have five metrics under this goal area. So it might take you um, a minute or two to get through this, but same basic idea.
All right, give us another second or two. Great. All right, so seeing um, the percent of exclusive transit right away as uh, jumping out as a top, um, looking at synergy with other efforts. So to what extent can we include transit priority in other things that are going on? Um, extent of known community support. I have to say when we did the tier two evaluation, uh, we had a hard time being objective with this one. Like how do we define known community support? So I agree it's a very important metric, um, but it was a little hard to do the evaluation at this point. I think when we get to recommendations, we'll be looking for letters of support and, and so on. Um, followed by ability to phase, and so here we're looking specifically at being able to use the existing uh, silver line fleet, um, followed by cost effectiveness. All right, so let's proceed. And this is, I think, our final one, and that is how should we prioritize our goal areas? Um, and so this is taking a step back, looking at the five goal areas, and doing the same basic um, exercise, allocating your 100 points to the five goal areas. You can weight them all equally. You can weight one over another. Take your time and hit submit. And I'll wait um, again until we're over that 20 submittal threshold. All right, well, we've hit some critical mass. Um, feel free to keep submitting. Um, and I will say, yeah, feel free to just keep on going. Um, we will tally these and put them at the end of our presentation. So it's part of what goes up on the website um, at the end of this meeting. Um, but we're seeing, um, yeah, this is really interesting. So we're seeing by far the goal area of expanding mobility and access um, followed by advancing equity. And then following um, the, the, the other three kind of in, in close grouping of feasible and implementable solutions, climate change resilience and sustainability and improving safety. We felt a little guilty to be honest when we were doing this exercise as a technical team, because of course we care about climate change resilience. Uh, of course we care about safety. We did also find that any of these solutions are going to make a positive um, improvement in those, in those goal areas though. So don't feel too guilty. All right, I'm going to turn it back to you, Doug. Thank you, everybody, for participating in that. We'll go back to the slide deck. And um, Doug, I think you wanted to go through a couple more slides. Yep. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for participating in that. Um, as Teresa said, you know, thankfully, the goal areas and the metrics really aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, alternatives that expand mobility and access often also advance equity, um, as well as get at the other goal areas. So these things, even though the way that Menti's set up is sort of makes them mutually exclusive because you have to assign points to them or select different ones in reality, that's obviously not how that actually works. But uh, we thought that that would be a useful exercise for everyone. So thank you all for bearing with us through that. And I hope that you had uh, fun doing it. Um, now we'll actually tell you how the alternatives did on all of our metrics, um, including what actually made a difference and what didn't make a difference ultimately in the analysis. Um, when we started this process, we created this really long list of all of the metrics that we wanted to use to evaluate all, the, all these alternatives. Um, and at the time, before we got into the analysis, we weren't sure really what was going to be the differentiator between these and what wasn't. Um, ultimately, what we found was that there was a big difference between the alternatives when it came to ridership, especially ridership amongst transit-dependent populations, um, 
the comparison of transit travel time to drive time, or in other words, competitiveness between transit and other modes, um, reduction in passenger minutes of delay on other bus routes that overlap with these. Um, and then there were big differences in what we found we could likely do with our existing bus fleet. And we saw you know, huge differences in what transit priority provisions made for these alternatives. Uh, there were a bunch of metrics that ended up making really no discernible difference between the alternatives. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, Laura, um, and you'll see that under improving safety, those metrics ended up not really having different results for any of the alternatives. Um, and part of the reason why is because when we started this process, we we thought that it might be the case that for some of the alignments that we looked at, there might be known pedestrian or uh, cycling safety issues that would need to be addressed. And of course, that is the case of some of the intersections that we have in our alignments. But we ultimately realized that because of the capital improvements that would be necessary in order to extend Silver Line service, any issues out there would be able to be addressed through roadway reconstruction um, and the work generally associated with extending these alternatives. So that's part of the reason why I wanted to skip over that in the mentee exercise. Um, also, it's, you know, it's those two are not, do not need to be mutually exclusive, especially in a situation where we're talking about potentially reconstructing roadways, widening right of way um, in order to extend transit service. There were some other metrics that ended up not making much of a difference, which is kind of surprising to us. So the first was access to jobs. All of the alternatives that we've looked at did a really good job of improving access to jobs. And the, the difference was not really significant enough to really make a difference between the alternatives. Basically, they all increase access to jobs by a really substantial amount, and the difference between them was kind of negligible. Um, same thing with um, change in transit mode split, like we did in the CDPS modeling see changes in mode split, but between the different alternatives, there, there weren't any alternatives that really stood out on that metric. Uh, but we wanted to ask everyone to prioritize these before we then told you what ended up actually making a difference in the evaluation or not. Um, that's not to say that the metrics we highlighted on the last slide and the one we highlighted here are necessarily going to be weighted differently. When we go to select or recommend alternatives, um, but we do want, did want to mention this so that when you see the alternatives analysis results later, um, you'll see, okay, yeah, on some of these metrics, all the alternatives basically scored the same, and on some of them, they scored quite differently. Next slide. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa and to Laura. They're going to talk about the tier two evaluation methodology sort of at a really high level, and then we'll share the results and walk through the alternatives one by one. So that's Teresa. Thanks, Doug. Um, and I do have a little bit of a cough, so I, I hope that I don't cough on you all. Um, but we'll start with a refresh on our assumptions. Um, this part of our work was a deep dive using many tools. We bit, feel a bit badly um, showering you <laughs> with a lot of technical information today. And yet behind what we share today is a set of spreadsheets and model outputs, um, which is what you asked us to do with the study. And I wanna walk you through the tools that we used. Um, first of all, we worked closely with Drashti and Rose at CTPS on the CTPS modeling. They are here today and they can answer questions related to um, the CTPS modeling efforts. They provided us with ridership, um, VMT, mode split, greenhouse gas emission um, change outputs, and they also conducted a thorough environmental justice analysis for the tier two alternatives. Now, one of the drawbacks of doing our work concurrent with Beanard is that we didn't have a future Beanard um, set of recommendations to connect our work to. One tool we did have was the Beanard maps in Remix. You might remember that that was available online, um, we also had access to it. So we were able to take those um, draft recommendations and, and play around with our tier two alternatives. And um, we use the Jane tool in Remix uh, to look at uh, job access. We also use Remix to identify operating costs. 
Our engineering team defined the alternatives at a conceptual level. We did this using design standards and right away and traffic information that was provided by many of you. This allowed us <clears throat> to develop spreadsheets that calculated high level costs, level of transit priority, ability to phase in over time. We also did um, a bunch of off-model modeling uh, using spreadsheet tools for fleet planning, travel time estimates, and ratio of transit to drive time. Um, we also had travel time estimates as an output from CTPS, which was fantastic, um, in which we were able to calibrate information from a couple of different sources um, there. And finally, we did some of our work in GIS. The land use pieces specifically, we had in shapefile format and we were able to do queries to identify access to land uses from our identified station locations. This was a village effort. Um, the team featured several folks on the consultant team, not just those of us at Nelson Nygaard, but with our partners at McMahon and RKG, as well as CTPS. And on the next slide, you can see, um, we show on this slide and the next slide, um, we showed these at our last meeting, but we wanna have them at top of mind. We have eight model runs scoped in total, and to date we've used seven of them. So we do have one additional model run that we can use if needed when we get to the recommendation stage. The CTPS model used 2040 as the analysis year, the existing bus network as its space, and um, a set of transportation and land use investments as assumptions. In general, when we added uh, transportation and land use investments into the, um, the CTPS model snow build, we tried to be conservative. Um, things that were completed, that were in construction, were in the pipeline to the extent that funding had been identified and permits received. There were um, a ton of developments that met this definition. And as you can see on, on this slide, um, <coughs> on the land use side in particular, we started with the land use assumptions that were used in the Lower Mystic study, and we added developments that met the criteria above. We didn't constrain ourselves to regional control caps, and this resulted in additional over 40,000 jobs, almost 25,000 in population, and 10,000 households. So next slide, let's dive into our findings. Next slide. Oh, sorry about a cough. So to iterate something that Doug said earlier, we know we're presenting a lot of technical information. We've tried to make it as high level as we can, and yet still it's a challenge. Not just from the sense it's a lot of information, but that we're not making any decisions. We're just presenting information today, talking about it, answering questions, and collecting questions that we might need to answer in the coming weeks. And we start with some high level findings across all of our SL3 extension alternatives. And you'll see we have a series of slides on SL3 extensions, alts one through three, and then we'll have a discussion about those. And then we have a series of slides on the SL6 alternatives, alts four through seven, and we'll have discussion about those. So one thing that is true for all of the SL3 extension alternatives, first, they increase ridership on the SL3 by a lot. This is between 90 and 150% when compared to the no-build condition. This is a quality connection to the Orange Line. Second, we believe that this high quality investment is pro providing bus, dedicated bus transit priority and specifically between the Chelsea Busway and Everett Square. Third, <clears throat> that we can extend the SL3 to the Orange Line with the current vehicle fleet. Fourth, that investments in bus transit priority all take safety into account. So going back to skipping that goal area, um, we're really finding that when you're going to make the investment, you're going to improve safety conditions and specifically to the network's most vulnerable users, um, pedestrians and cyclists. So we're expected to see improvements in safety in our study area regardless. Next, that investments in um, uh, transit priority is providing opportunities for jobs. And these are all kinds of jobs within this reasonable, we define reasonable as 45 minute transit commute ride. And lastly, and this is just the SL3 extensions, we really didn't see any dramatic change in transit mode shift. Excuse me, next slide.
So this slide shows our tier two findings on one slide. And this again is just for the SL3 extension. So a lot of information and yet it's still pretty high level. So we'll show this slide a few times. And this time, the first time you see it, is just to orient you to the information that you're seeing on the screen. The rows of the table are evaluation metrics and our goal areas. The columns are our alternatives. The color ramp here shows that nothing performs badly. The worst color that you see here is white or transparent. That's the lower and the darker the green is showing the greater the performance. We want to um, encourage you to not count the greens. There's a correlation for sure between how well an alternative performs in different metric areas. But as we discussed earlier, some of these metrics are more meaningful than others. Things that pop out and that we'll come back to again are as follows. Ridership. All of our alternatives have high ridership. There is higher ridership for Alt 1 and 3 than Alt 2. And one thing to note here, um, we did, of course, round to the nearest 100. And um, you see two rows here. The first is um, uh, the total ridership on the SL3. And then uh, the bottom row is showing how that is different from the SL3 in the no build condition without the extension. So you see in pretty dramatic changes. Second of all, travel time reliability is higher for Alt 3. This makes sense is that um, the Alt 3, which is um, extending to Sullivan, also has the highest level of transit priority, which improves travel times but it especially improves travel times when general purpose lanes are congested and, and that affects drive times. Next is the more the alignment is used by other MBTA bus routes, the gra greater the travel time savings is when this is aggregated and we look at total reductions in delay on the system. And because we know that bus routes in our study area carry more people of color and more people of low incomes, we acknowledge this as an equity benefit. And we looked at costs. Cost is the bottom row down here. We looked at, um, at cost effectiveness, but also we looked at very high level planning level cost estimates. These were based on design assumptions and what we call unit costs. Um, we assumed where we could assume that things were done by others, we did. But if we couldn't make that case, we assumed the costs ourselves. Um, the assumptions that went into this are pretty detailed and localized and involved many of you as our engineering team reached out to um, uh, clarify assumptions as they developed their estimates. Um, on the next slide, you can see a series of trade-off slides. We have one trade-off slide for each of these alternatives. And here is Alt-1, this is Malden Center. This alternative does really well in terms of ridership overall and ridership for transit critical populations. Where the alternative doesn't do as well is in its ability to provide transit priority along Ferry Street. Um, the street isn't wide enough for bus lanes um, and there aren't any candidate parallel corridors that would have this width. Instead, we did the best we could with Q jumps at intersections um, and transit signal priority. This obviously um, has a, a negative impact on travel times as well as on travel time reliability, uh, because as you have congestion in the corridor, you have congestion on um, bus travel times or unreliability on bus travel times. The other piece here um, is under cost effectiveness in that the Ferry Street Reconstruction Project is funded and in the queue for construction right now. This project improves um, pedestrian safety um, it, by in part providing curb extensions, which we did go um, and assume that we'd reconstruct those um, to put in transit queue jumps at intersections. Um, and that has an effect um, on uh, costs, total costs and cost effectiveness. On the next slide, you can see Alt 2. This is the Wellington alternative. It doesn't carry the ridership demand that we see in the other alternatives. There's less transit priority beyond Broadway, um, which makes transit trips similar to drive times. And when the stretch of roadway is congested, um, buses are caught in that congestion too. 
Um, however, because it doesn't require um, much construction beyond Broadway and Everett, it's relatively cost effective. Alt 3, as you can see on the next slide, performs pretty well on all the metrics, um, including ridership. Where it shines is in transit, travel time, reliability. We were able to assume a higher percentage of bus priority on this alternative than on the other alternatives. And this results in greater travel time advantage um, when compared to driving and um, better transit travel time reliability. You can argue, argue that tra um, travel time reliability can be more important than travel time itself in terms of setting schedules and expectations. So on the next slide, we go back to the summary. And here I invite you to zoom back out and see the big picture um, of our whole evaluation framework beyond the highlights. You can see the trends um, that I pointed out of, of ridership at the top and going down the line of the highlights, um, transit travel times, bus delay, use of the existing fleet, the amount of bus transit priority and cost effectiveness. You can also see the other metrics that didn't make as much of a difference or didn't rise to be key findings for this first batch of alternatives. Um, the next slide is discussion, but you don't have to go to that slide, Laura. Um, it probably makes sense, I think, for us to rest on this summary slide while we answer um, your questions and hear your thoughts. And we will take a couple of minutes here um, before we launch into the next batch of alternatives, the um, SL6 alternatives. So my colleague, Laura, um, did much of this analysis. We have Drashti and Rose from CTPS with us as well. So we're here to answer your questions. Maybe we could take five or so minutes uh, to hear from you. Oh, yes. And um, Julia is seeing your comment pop up. Um, this is just the SL3 portion. I have not been looking at chat, but I can. Okay. And if you have no questions and no comments, we can go to the other part of the presentation and always come back and take all of your. Yeah. After, maybe after Julia's question here, Teresa, we let's just go through the SL6 um, alternatives since we only have a half hour left. Okay. I, I just have a quick question. Of course. Sorry. Hi, it's uh, Julia Wallers from ITDP. Um, this would be cross-cutting for both the SL3 and SL6 since one of the criteria is potential for bus priority um, as the ranking pros and cons. I'm just curious like, what exactly the criteria was for that? to determine and is are you looking at dedicated bus lanes, center running, uh, mm -hmm. bus hold extensions, just how was that factored in for that particular criteria? Yeah, we spent a lot of time in that area, to be honest. Um, so we defined the alternatives to do the ridership modeling. And here we looked at, um, because it makes a difference in travel times and in travel time reliability. And we looked for every section of each alignment where we could fit in um, bus lanes. And our top priority was uh, to provide high quality, um, a dedicated uh, bus transit. And so we looked at uh, dedicated bus lanes wherever possible. And where we needed to have a discussion about trade-offs, whether it was um, bus priority or um, general purpose lane, or on-street parking, um, we, tr we tried to the extent that we could to stay within the existing right-of-way, um, but where we didn't feel like we could put in um, a dedicated bus lane, that's where we really focused in on queue jumps at intersections and at transit signal priority um, at intersections. And Ferry Street being an example of where we really tried uh, to provide the highest level of transit priority, but recognizing that we are in a really constrained um, right away environment. And so that's where we focused on what we could do within general purpose um, uh, um, lanes. Um, but but wherever we could fit in uh, bus lanes, we did. Yeah, and there were situations in which we worked with municipalities to identify places where it would be likely that we could widen the right of way. So. We've been working with the city of Everett specifically on 
Second uh, Street and on Lower Broadway to figure out what the operating conditions for buses would be like. So we did assume continuous bus lanes on Lower Broadway, um, just starting just south of Sweetser Circle and then going all the way uh, from there into Sullivan Square based on the conversations that we had with the city of Everett. Um, and we assumed side running bus lanes on Second Street um, under the assumption that Second Street, the right of way would be widened as that corridor develops. So it's not a combination of existing status quo conditions, potential and potential for transformation changes based on municipal willingness and capacity of the roadway. Essentially, yeah. yes. And in, in all cases, we, we were in conversations with the municipalities, the stakeholders. I, I think a good example of this is actually under the SL6 alternatives, but like the Gilmore Bridge, um, Alt 5 goes to Kendall from Sullivan via Rutherford Ave and the Gilmore Bridge. And we know that the Gilmore Bridge is a pretty constrained condition. And what yet we also know that transit priority um, makes a big difference. And so we had a series of conversations about what we could assume there. And we went ahead and assumed that we were making a policy recommendation that we uh, convert um, some general purpose to transit or to, to bus lines um, there so that we could take advantage of the uh, travel time savings. All right, we have a couple of questions. Um, and Suzanne, I'm seeing your question in the chat, but why don't I give you the opportunity since you raised your hand to come off mute and ask or ask whatever questions you have. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you to specifically address the equity metric when you're reviewing these specific alternatives. I, I, I'm having a very hard time on my laptop reviewing the summary sheet, but um, I, it looks to me that there's a significant difference. And so for these SL3, but also the SL6, I just really like you to clearly speak to that. Thank okay. you. Yeah, um, and specifically what was a differentiator under the SL3 extension alternatives is this um, reduction in a delay for all buses that are able to take advantage of, um, of the um, capital investments put in by the, um, the transit priority. And so here we, we did make um, an assumption after much discussion um, that we would allow MBTA buses to take advantage of bus lanes um, that were being put in place through the Silver Line uh, process. And so um, what Laura on our team did, and she can answer more specific questions about how she did it, is just aggregate up what we're seeing in terms of delay on those routes today and then the savings that could result on those non-Silver Line routes um, as, as a result of putting in dedicated bus lanes, um, aggregate that up and then um, average it out. And you can see that it's pretty dramatic in terms of 2.9 minutes a day on all three, even 1.1 minutes a day on the Malden Center alternative. Um, that can make a difference in somebody's life. And we did put that under the equity goal um, because we do acknowledge that, especially in our study area, we um, have some information about who's riding the MBTA buses and know that it's a greater proportion of persons of color and uh, persons with low income status um, than the region as a whole. Um, and when we get to the Alt six, sorry, the SL6 alternatives, you can see that that's even more dramatic in terms of aggregate travel time savings or reductions of delay. I also will say that, you know, we were excited about access to jobs. Um, you don't see that as a differentiator there. We looked at access to jobs for um, everybody in our study area via a 45 minute transit commute, as well as um, uh, uh, transit critical populations, those who may be more reliant on transit uh, to commute to work. Um, and uh, it didn't show to be a differentiator here, but we see some different results for the SL6 alternatives. Eric? Oh, thank you. Uh, this is really great. Um, and in many ways, this is, I, I would say, somewhat um, you know, intuitive that that solvent, the solvent square alternative seems to pop on a lot of these these metrics, and and the results here you know make sense to me. 
Um, the one question I just have at the bottom under cost effectiveness, my screen, I can't really read the last one about with the numbers there for cost. There's like some numbers under medium, high, high. Can mm -hmm. you tell me what those numbers are? And are those are those the capital costs or are those? Yeah, capital costs. And what are the numbers? Planning level cost estimates. So rounded to the nearest 5 million and to be taken with a grain of salt. Of course, yeah. But we basically, our engineering team really leaned in to this process um, and it worked with many of you on like, what should they assume for, you're gonna put in a bus lane, do you have to reconstruct the pavement? What does that mean? Can you just paint something? Um, the level of construction that would be uh, needed and then everything from upgrading the signal equipment, any right of way that would need to be acquired, whether you're doing anything on structures, um, all of the details, they've documented everything um, and then added contingency to that. I just yeah, can't. So, Eric, for, screen, I just can't yeah, see. for Malden Center, it's a, the estimate is 130 million. For Wellington, it was 90, and for Sullivan, it was 95. And the, the difference in cost with the Malden Center alternative there is really Ferry Street and having to sort of deconstruct some of the uh, sidewalk bump outs at intersections in order to have transit queue jumps. So that if we were to pursue that alternative, that would be a major cost. That's not obviously reflected in the other alternatives because they wouldn't be using that alignment. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, um, let's move on to the SL6 alternatives. All right, so um, all five, oh, four, five, six, and seven. Um, just remember that these all connect Upper Broadway and Everett to either Kendall or downtown Boston. They do it in slightly different ways. Um, all four and five connect Everett with Kendall. They're identical all the way down to Sullivan, but differ past the orange line connection. Alt four travels along Washington and Graff to Leachmere. Alt five goes down Rutherford over the Gilmore Bridge to Leachmere. Alt six um, connects Sullivan to Haymarket via Rutherford and Washington. Um, and then um, as Doug mentioned, alts four, five, and six assume that SL3 is extended to Everett Square. Um, that allows the um, transfer connection between SL3 and SL6. Um, Alt 7 is our newer alternative. It provides that one seat ride between Chelsea and, um, and Kendall. And it starts back at Eastern Ave. You might recall from our conversations this summer, um, we wanted to eliminate the need for a transfer. So we started this alternative um, back closer to downtown Chelsea. It travels along the Chelsea um, busway, then follows the SL3 alignments to Everett Square and then down to Sullivan and over to um, Kendall via Washington McGrath. So it's true of all these alternatives, they all provide tremendous access to jobs. I guess this is no surprise you're connecting with Kendall and downtown Boston. They all do really well in terms of transit priority. They're all expected to improve safety, especially for vulnerable users or cyclists and pedestrians. These ones move the needle on uh, transit mode splits. Not by a ton, but they do. It's, it's worth noting. And they all rely on investments that are made by others. And um, you'll see in the cost effectiveness metric, this, this actually makes a difference in terms of cost effectiveness, what is assumed to be done uh, versus what is assumed as part of our project. Next slide. Um, here's the summary slide for these. Um, Laura is going to go into the key findings but uh, by alternative, but I'll set it up um, at a big picture level. First is that ridership to a Kendall destination is uh, quite higher uh, than to downtown Boston. Laura will go into this in a little bit more detail. What we're seeing is that um, some riders transfer to the Orange Line uh, at Sullivan under Alt-6 instead of staying on the Silver Line um, and going down Rutherford Ave into Haymarket. Second, that the overall Silver Line ridership is pretty stable uh, between the other alternatives. And here, um, I just want to point out um, that in Alt 7, we have a little bit of service redundancy in the Chelsea busway. Um, and what I mean by that is between um, Eastern Ave and the Chelsea station, 
we have both the SL3 running as well as SL6 running. Um, and so what that does is it increases our ridership on the SL6 because we're seeing that riders take the first available bus to them. But you can see that it decreases the ridership on the SL3. It all ends up kind of as a, a wash because you have the overall demand is relatively stable between the alts four, five, and seven. Um, as I mentioned, all the alternatives do great in terms of providing high levels of exclusive transit right of way. This is between 75 and 90%. You can see this the um, second to bottom row here. It lends itself to very competitive transit travel times. Uh, you don't have buses getting stuck in traffic. We do see somewhat higher access to affordable housing and transit oriented development under the Haymarket alternative um, is that access to um, downtown Boston. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that um, all buses being able to take advantage of the bus lanes, the dedicated bus lanes, results in some pretty significant um, reductions in delay. And that, again, is under the equity goal. That second metric there, you're seeing between 4.8 minutes and seven minutes of uh, a reduction of delay. That's substantial. Um, and then uh, a couple of additional findings before I turn it over to Laura. Um, with all the alternatives, we see a need to expand the size of the fleet. Um, this has definite impacts on um, our ability to implement in the short term, right? You need to acquire the vehicles. Not only do you need to acquire the vehicles, but you need to have a place to store and maintain them. And that difference is varied a little bit, um, but it's between nine and, and 13 new vehicles that we're seeing as being needed. And then that reliance on work that's underway by others. Um, Sullivan Reconstruction, of course, but Rutherford Avenue, um, McGrath, uh, depending on the commitments that are made, that does have an effect on uh, cost effectiveness. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Great, and I'll do a deep dive into Alt 4 and the following alternatives. So Alternative 4 does very well with overall ridership. And actually, when we combine SL3 and SL6 ridership, it is the one that has the most riders among SL6 alternatives. Um, as you can see in this map, Alt 4 connects Everett residents to Kendall and connects to Sullivan Square and to Green Line stations. Um, and while it has the lowest extent of transit priority among SL6 alternatives, it still shows great potential for travel time reductions for overlapping MBTA services. Um, in Somerville and Cambridge, Alternative 4 runs through areas that are generally bike and pedestrian friendly. As the previous table shows, 90% um, of the stops in this alternative are accessible by bike. Um, this alternative has great potential to share some of the reconstruction costs with McGrath, uh, the McGrath Boulevard Redesign Project. Um, and as Teresa said, and what is true for all the alternatives, um, this can now be operated with the existing Silver Line bus fleet. Okay. And over here in the bottom of these slides, which we didn't have for the SL3 alternatives, we have a comparison timetable between what it would take to travel via rapid transit, so orange line or red line. Uh, between Selvin Square and the final terminus, in this ca case, Kendall. And we can see that the Silver Line 6 Alt 4 would be quite competitive between taking Sullivan to downtown and then downtown crossing on the red line back to Kendall. So now to Alt 5. Um, so Alternative 5 is a slightly shorter route than Alternative 4, as you can see in this alignment. Um, and by nature of being shorter, this alternatively, alternative also has a slightly lower travel time than alternative four, which is, which is further enhanced by a really high percentage of transit priority is the one that has the highest of all our SL6 alternatives. Um, but as is also the case in alternative four, alternative five is likely to experience delays, particularly in the outbound direction around Kendall, where there, we observe a lot of congestion on Ames and Broadway. Um, as we discussed in our last meeting, a key distinction between alternatives five and four is the approach to Kendall from Rutherford and the Gilmore Bridge. We did acknowledge that the Gilmore Bridge can see congestion. Um, and after we consulted several stakeholders, we made the policy assumption that we would have bus lanes in each direction on the Gilmore Bridge and a station at Community College. So this alternative provides two points of connection to the orange line. 
Um, and pavement reconstruction and painting for the bus lanes is included in our cost estimates for this alternative, which make it a little bit more expensive than alternative four as well. In alternative six, from Everett to Haymarket via Rutherford, this is the only SL6 alternative that connects Everett directly to downtown Boston. This alternative performs well on a number of metrics as you can see listed here, um, including the extent of transit priority, access to jobs, which makes sense because it has a downtown terminus, access to affordable housing units, and potential for cost sharing with the Rutherford Ave reconstruction project. Um, but what we saw is that alternative six really felt short um, on ridership. Projected ridership for alternative, alternative six is more than a third lower than other SL6 alternatives. This ridership drop is mostly because there are so many competing services between Selvin and downtown. Our ridership, ridership modeling um, done by CTPS, and they can speak to a little bit more on that, assumed the implementation of the red line and orange line transformation projects, which should result in approximately four and a half minute peak headways for the orange line in this segment. And competition along the Rutherford corridor would be even fiercer once Beanard is implemented and the T101 comes online. So there is a high likelihood that people using the service would at Selvin transfer onto the orange line instead of continuing on the silver line. The last alternative that we'll review today is alternative seven from Chelsea to Kendall via McGrath. Um, the last of our SL6 alternatives was added um, to the process this summer um, with the purpose of understanding the impact and the demand for a more direct connection from Chelsea to Kendall. As a reminder, in ALTS 4 and 5, Chelsea residents could take the extended SL3 to Everett Square and their transfer onto the SL6. In Alternative 7, getting from the center of Chelsea, or from the edge of Chelsea really, all the way to Kendall is a one-seat ride. This alternative is by far the longest route, um, and it is also the most expensive route according to our evaluation, but it still performs well on several fronts. As Teresa mentioned earlier, it has the highest ridership um, among SL6 alternatives, if we look just as at SL6 ridership, although part of its riders seem to be diverted from SL3, uh, which it overlaps with for much of the Chelsea busway. Um, this alternative shows promising time travel savings compared to driving because buses can use the busway the whole way while vehicles have to use you know, other routes that are faced with traffic. And it also serves many of the travel flows, equity travel flows with high demand among transit critical populations that we observed. When we did that analysis, we saw that there was high demand for travel and connections between Everett and Chelsea, Chelsea and Glendale Square, and then even further into Eastern East Boston. So having a direct route that connects the edge of Chelsea deep into Everett uh, served many of the travel flows and it's a significant differentiator. Uh, like alternative four, um, we estimate that operating alternative seven will require up to 13 new Silver Line vehicles, which is the most for any alternative. So again, we go back to Silver Line, to the SL6 summary slide, um, and you can see the big picture. Do we also want to open uh, a few minutes for discussion? Teresa? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just like we did before, uh, toss your questions our way. Um, definitely see a couple of hands raised. So let's start with you and we'll also be uh, checking the chat as well. So let's start with you, Matt. Hey, Teresa. Hey, Doug. Thanks very much, guys, for a really, really great presentation and for Sort of all the work you've been putting in here. I know it's been taking uh, taking a number of years, and I think we're excited to see sort of the sort of finalization, uh, sort of all of this work come to fruition. I guess I would just maybe advocate thinking about the unique populations that each of these routes are serving, and maybe thinking about the potential for not just one of these alternatives to come out, but maybe multiple of these alternatives to come out, given again, the very unique travel demands and patterns that they're all serving. So, you know, the route from Sullivan to Kendall via McGrath, 
obviously serves a growing community on sort of in our neighbor in Somerville. The routes via Rutherford serve growing uh, communities in Charlestown to get either downtown or to Kendall. So I think we would want to think through a way to incorporate more of this, um, you know, for the future and uh, to maybe advance multiple of these routes going forward. So thanks very much, guys. Just want to put that out there. Thanks, Matt. I do uh, want to make a point here that one of the major limitations of the uh, modeling for this study was that it did not incorporate bus network redesign. Um, obviously, we did not have a final map that we could use until probably, what was it, two or three weeks ago. So all this work was done over the summer where bus network redesign was still ongoing and the final state of the map was not going to be known until this fall. Um, but now that we have a final map for bus network redesign, we know there's going to be a high frequency service from Sullivan Square to uh, Kendall through Charlestown. So that uh, route, the T101, will be providing um, that connection that we analyzed in um, our Rutherford to Kendall alternative. Uh, there's also the T7, which goes from Sullivan Square through downtown. So that provides that connection as well. So I think some of the connections that we analyzed in this process are already in the works to be provided by high frequency routes through bus network redesign. Um, as I should also mention the Malden Center connection for the, um, that we showed as an SL3 here. So in bus network redesign, there's the T104, which goes from Malden Center to East Boston to connect to the Blue Line by way of Ferry Street and then Everett Square. And it actually follows um, to some extent the alignment that we showed in this process. And the, these two processes, Silverline Extension and Bus Network Redesign, um, were actually somewhat complementary of each other in that as we were developing alignments for alternatives, that information was incorporated into Bus Network Redesign. And that's why you see um, for some of the routes in Bus Network Redesign, why they're routed the way they are is because of some of the work that we had done earlier on to evaluate those alignments. So many of these connections will be provided with high frequency routes through bus network redesign. It will, just won't necessarily be a silver line service. Um, it'll be 40 foot buses rather than articulated buses. Uh, but to your point about multiple services in the future, so we have the, the scope and budget to do another model run. And we were saving that for an evaluation of a combination of an SL3 alternative and an SL6 alternative. Um, so we intend to do that additional model run and that analysis this winter um, before we get to the point where we make recommendations. Um, another thing that I really want to emphasize that Teresa touched on as she went through her slides is that based on our analysis, we believe that the SL3 could be extended using the existing Silverline fleet. So the limitation to SL3 implementation is really cost and then the, the construction or reconstruction of roadways in order to get the transit priority that'd be necessary to run the service. For the SL6 alternatives, we do not currently have the buses to run these services if you know, we assume they would be articulated Silverline buses. Um, we do not have the buses in the fleet to provide that service. So in order to provide any of these services that we're showing on this slide, um, we would need to procure more articulated buses. And in order to do that, we would also need to expand our uh, storage and maintenance facilities. And as you know, there is a process underway to modernize all of the bus garages in the MBTA system, but that is a multi-year effort to reconstruct those garages. Um, so if an SL6 were to be recommended through this process um, and then worked into the MBTA's future plans, it would need to fit into the fleet procurement uh, timeline and the timeline for modernizing those facilities. So at the end of this process, we may get to the point where we have sort of short-term, medium-term, and long-term recommendations, depending on uh, which alternatives we end up ending, uh, excuse me, we end up selecting in that, after that final analysis. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Jim, let's go to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, as Matt said, a fantastic amount of great in-depth work and analysis. Um, I think I just have one question about um, the change in travel time, I think you put it, um, which was kind of on Alt-4. 
Um, does that is that cumulative with the improvements to the existing routes, or is that just for the um, uh, silver line routing? Alvarez. Right. So in theory, that's in that instance where there's overlapping existing routes. I think this is to your point. Mm -hmm. Some of the metrics are showing better for those, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, excellent. Let's. Um, we have about five minutes left. Let's go to Representative Connolly. Uh, great. Thank you for the uh, presentation. It's been very uh, interesting and super informative. Um, really, no surprise to me that um, you would benefit more riders going from Chelsea to Kendall. Uh, and certainly I think that's a real need that we have is trying to connect more people uh, from the Chelsea Everett area over to Kendall. So certainly uh, am optimistic about those SL6 alternatives that would do that. Um, almost chuckled a little bit at the conversation about bus line, uh, bus lanes on um, the Gilmore Bridge, only because during the uh, Orange Line green, down, green Line shutdown, we pushed very hard for that, the MBTA and everyone responded nicely, although just by my own uh, going out to survey it, it was extremely difficult to get automobile drivers to comply with that, so I don't know if in the future, if these were permanent fixtures, uh, if we could get better compliance. And then the the, uh, the only real thing I wanted to ask of you was I did notice on the outreach process uh, that there had been five events in Everett, Chelsea, Somerville. I can tell you uh, that in East Cambridge in particular, my office has been getting different questions and concerns about what all this means. So I wanted to definitely recommend uh, perhaps a, a specific outreach engagement effort uh, in East Cambridge. Uh, the East Cambridge planning team uh, is certainly one venue that would typically be very interested uh, in this kind of presentation. So looking forward uh, to continuing to support all your work. Thanks. Thank you. Jay? You're on mute. Thanks, Teresa. And um, first, I want to thank the team, uh, Teresa and, and Laura and um, Doug and everybody at, at the T and CTPS who has contributed to this um, huge effort. Um, really, really appreciate the city of Everett. Um, this this represents, you know, something transformational for us uh, as a city that does not have rapid transit today. Um, so, you know, we, we, we'll be doing everything we can to support you guys uh, to move this forward. Um, I think it was a good point to note that, you know, you, Bus Network Redesign had not really been completed at the time um, that you did this analysis. And I know one of the routes sort of really does mirror um, one of the, I think it's one of the uh, phase one routes in bus network redesign, which is the T-104 going from Chelsea to Malden, uh, which is a great route and one that we, you know, wholeheartedly support. Um, and we will do, you know, as much as we can to make that route run um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, but I think then looking at the Silver Line 3 alternatives, we'd like to see something new um you know servicing solid and square um and so we, we do have a preference for that that alignment um but overall you know just again great great work um and one question i had for you guys was with regard to construction costs and i think you mentioned the the malden route was the most expensive um but the sullivan route which would utilize lower broadway and everett did that assume no reconstruction of lower broadway or what was the um Assumption there. We were assuming that we would the project would bear the cost there, so we weren't assuming any cost sharing necessarily, just to be conservative in the cost estimates. And we were assuming some reconstruction um, of roadway to make the um, the dedicated bus lanes happen. So, yeah, I'm just curious how that was a lower cost than Ferry Street. Ferry Street, it was the there was a lot of signal work. Um, mm -hmm. It was basically like. I don't know, it was basically a reconstruction of the what we assumed was the new construction and putting in new signal equipment and um, uh, the, the queue jumps at the intersection. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, it struck me a little bit that that would be more than, I mean, the Puerto Prado would seem pretty significant, seem to include all those same elements, and yet it's less. Um, obviously, we prefer the Broadway route and want to see a route, you know, on that quarter, but it did strike me a bit odd. The Mullen Center alignment was also a lot longer than Sullivan's, so uh, more intersections to okay. reconstruct. We are at time. I wonder if we could ask people for an additional five minutes to do a wrap. Um, I think if folks need to leave, I know that our wonderful facilitator, um, Reagan, uh, had to leave us, um, but um, but Doug and I can finish up, I think, the rest. And if you have to leave for another meeting or to watch the game, you are welcome to do so. Um, I do wonder, Doug, there are a couple of questions in the chat. If you want to take those on, um, or if you want to just uh, respond to chat questions via chat, I can do that while you are covering the final few slides. Um, I'd say I'll go through the last few slides and then you can respond to uh, okay. Julia and Suzanne's questions in the chat. Okay, sounds good. So we're going to skip going through sharing or, you know, the goal presentation results because you saw that already. Um, but I do want to talk about next steps for this process and where we go from here. Uh, can you go next slide, Laura? So we talked about the outreach that we've done prior to this working group meeting. Um, we have a, you can actually go to the next slide, Laura. We have a public meeting coming up um, on December 13th. I was gonna walk through the results that we've gotten for the online feedback form so far, but I think we'll skip this for now. Um, it's just from the results that we've received from that form to date. Uh, but I wanna cover next steps with folks uh, before folks have to go. So. That online feedback form is going to remain open through the public meeting on December 12th. Um, you can find the link to it on the project website. We encourage all of you to share it with your networks and your constituents and your communities. Um, we really want to get as much feedback as we possibly can through that online feedback form, but obviously that's not the only way that we'll get feedback from folks. Um, so we're going to have an, a virtual public meeting, as I mentioned, on December 12th. Um, that is posted on the project website. Um, and we have emails, we'll be emailing our project email list about that meeting as well. Um, and we do plan to augment this with some additional outreach this winter, uh, to your point, Representative Connolly. So we do plan to do more outreach around this. And then we anticipate holding the final external working group meeting and public meeting uh, this winter possibly at the end of January or beginning of February. That timeline of those meetings is sort of to be determined. Um, and in addition to that, we will be reaching out to the municipalities to meet one-on-one -on -one to answer additional questions, um, talk about the methodology for these metrics, and make sure that uh, we've communicated this well to all of our stakeholders before we get to those final stages. I also mentioned that we will do an additional model run where we will select an SL3 alternative and an SL6 alternative and do a combined model run of those to see how they perform together. So before we do that final model run, we wanted folks to have a sh chance to review uh, the results of the analysis in this content and then give us their feedback on it. So we will share this presentation with everybody um, and reach out to have further discussions about the results in our methodology. But with that, I think, so this is what I just said in timeline form, essentially. <laughs> uh, with that, we won't turn it over to public comment because we're at time. Uh, we will share the presentation with all the working group members, uh, and it will be posted on the project website in addition to the recording of this meeting. Uh, Doug, real that, quick, I just want to say the, the meeting's on 12 13. Um, December 13th, not the 12th. <laughs> Sorry, the meeting is on the 13th of December. I misspoke earlier, keep doing that. There's many, many meetings uh, in December right before Christmas. Um, but this will be on the 13th. So hopefully see you all there. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope everybody has a chance to go watch uh, the US and the World Cup right now. So bye everybody, have a great Bye. afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.